Hi, and uh, thanks for joining us tonight. My name is Gerard Ross. I was a consultant surgeon, and I'm now an MLA, and I'm joined by my colleagues, Dr. Sam Bell and Dr. Ed Nansoma. And tonight we're going to be talking about managing complaints. So in terms of format for tonight, I plan to talk for about 40 minutes, and then we're going to try and answer the questions as a panel. So uh, on your GoToWebinar app, you'll see that there's a drop down for you to ask questions. So please do use that. And remember, the more focused the question, the, more, the clearer the question, the more likely we'll be able to address it. Don't worry, we won't be mentioning anybody's name during the questions and answers. So you really can't ask, ask anything as long as it's related clearly. You will get a certificate of attendance at the end uh, if that's something that you want to use and want to have for your appraisal. And we are planning to put a recording of this on the on the website at some point. This has been a really popular topic, and um, we will be rerunning this at some point, probably in the middle of May, just sorting out the date at the moment. So tonight uh, I'm going to be talking about. Um, the oh, there we are complaints in general including the frequency of complaints the impacts of them why they're important how we recognize them uh, how we acknowledge and investigate a complaint how doctors should respond to complaints how you plan for a meeting with a complainant and what if a complainant is not happy if what if the complaint is not resolved now Depending on your role as a, as a doctor, whether you're a GP or whether you work in hospital, the amount of involvement for you um, with uh, these various parts of the process may vary. So in terms of um, investigating a complaint, then if you're a consultant or you work in hospital, then you may not have a big part in that unless you've got a managerial role or unless you're in private practice. Alternatively, if you're a practice manager in general practice, then how you investigate a complaint is going to be a big part of this. So not necessarily all of the individual parts I talk about will apply to everybody who is listening, but the general theme, I think, uh, should apply to everybody. So how common are they? Well, here are the numbers. In 2018 to 2019, which is the last full year that we've got data for, there are around about 209,000 complaints, and um, so about 570 complaints in any one day. In hospitals, about 40% uh, of complaints were about medical staff, and similar numbers in general practice. 41% uh, of complaints were about GPs or dentists. They didn't actually separate the two in the data that they presented. So in primary care, about 12% of the complaints related to clinical treatment, but interestingly, a greater percentage related to how doctors and staff communicated with patients, and a similarly a greater number than the 12% of clinical treatment, 13% related to staff attitude and behaviours and values. Um, the majority of complaints were about practitioners. I've not broken that down beyond uh, practitioners because obviously in general practice and primary care there's a number of different practitioner types seeing patients nowadays. It's not all doctors uh, and about 26 percent were due to, um, were made about admin staff uh, including receptionists. In secondary care, the data was presented in a slightly different way. About 27% were classified as being about clinical treatment. I guess that's possibly um, more understandable because often they're being referred to hospital with a specific issue to be dealt with. 21% um, were related to communication, so again, quite a high percentage related to how you communicate to patients. 17% to patient care and 14% again related to attitudes displayed or allegedly displayed by staff. 40% down to medical staff and 23% about nursing staff. So as you all know, if you have uh, had complaints, they are both stressful and time consuming, but not just for patients, for those being complained about, 
and for those who are investigating the complaints, trying to untie the Gordian knot, as it might appear uh, when facing a complicated, multi-paged complaint. But we know from our research as well that um, complaints have big impacts on, on our members. And this is just one slide of some of a survey that we did of about 750 members, of whom about 40% were GPs, slightly more were consultants, and about 10% were trainees. You can see, I think, from this slide that complaints uh, result in a significant personal impact on, on the doctors surveyed. A quarter and a third, between a quarter and a third of doctors had these significant impacts, with many more being impacted to a still significant but perhaps lesser degree. In the same groups of doctors were particularly good at getting help um, with complaints, where other groups of doctors were less, uh, less um, tended less to involve their MDOs. So GPs were very good at picking up the phone to their to their MDO and asking for assistance. About eighty percent of the doctors that we surveyed um, did so if they were worked in general practice. But interestingly, consultants were less keen to involve their defence organisation for whatever reason, and there were a range of reasons given. But even more interestingly, the trainees involved their MDOs even less. So I think I can understand it for consultants to some extent, because a lot of the management of a complaint will be done by the trust or the health board um, rather than by them themselves. But we found it all a bit, a bit concerning uh, because we deal with complaints and their sequelae on a day-to-day -day basis. And it can be quite hard for us as, as medical legal advisors to identify cases that are going to go on to develop into into something else. It's not easy for us to tell, tell in advance which ones are definitely going to cause a problem. And that's a fundamental point for us because it may only, in inverted commas, be a complaint, but doctors are vulnerable and employers, if you're an employed doctor, won't manage all issues that can arise from a complaint and won't necessarily manage complaints well. And this comes back to a slide which maybe many of you will have seen in the past, which is this idea of multiple jeopardy. Um, for you as a clinician, when something goes wrong, often people will think about being sued, but that isn't the, the only or indeed often the most significant issue that a doctor might face when, when something goes wrong. We've mentioned complaints and Complaints may run alongside um, a disciplinary investigation if you're in, in the hospital or, or working in, in the NHS in, the, in general practice. You could have a GMC investigation from a complaint. You may have a coroner's inquest ongoing from a complaint. So at the same time as a patient dies or, or shortly thereafter, a complaint comes in and the coroner opens an inquest and you've got to manage all of these things at the same time. We're often very wrapped up in our jobs as doctors, and it, and it can it takes a long time to get the positions that we're in. And when a complaint is made, it can feel exceedingly personal and quite wounding. And we never know which of the clinical contacts we have might result in a, in a complaint. Um, and this is often an area uh, of concern for the doctors that I speak to. So why are complaints so important? Well, doctors and nurses are obligated to respond to patient concerns. And the CQC in England, and I apologise for referring to English legislation and, and English um, regulations. That, that's just a catch on. I want to, I'm Scottish and I've worked in Scotland and in England. And to reassure people who are not in England, the what I'm saying here about complaints applies to uh, a greater to a great degree in Scotland and Northern Ireland and Wales as well. It's not all about uh, the English jurisdiction. There are some subtle variations in different parts of, of the UK and Northern Ireland, but the um, general thrust of the approach that we're going to be talking about here applies all over. So going back to the CQC, they, they, are, they require that all registered providers uh, make sure that people can issue can respond to a complaint about their 
care. And on top of that, there are the other obligations that we know about. There's the regulations, be that the English regulations, the Scottish ones, the Welsh, or the, or the ones indeed in Northern Ireland. And there's the obligations that we all have as registered uh, doctors um, with the GMC. The GM, Good Medical Practice says at paragraph 73, you must cooperate with formal inquiries and complaints procedures. Sometimes people will say, well, this complaint was so ridiculous that clearly it's not something that we need to worry about. So this question was, was focused, some was uh, brought up thinking about that. Something need not be treated as a complaint when the complaint has no basis and is clearly unreasonable. True or false? Well, that's obviously false. A complaint or concern is an expression of dissatisfaction about an act or a mission or a decision of NHS England, either verbal or written, or whether justified or not, which requires a response. And again, NHS England's mentioned here, the definitions in other parts of the UK and around are similar. All formal complaints must be in writing. Again, that is inaccurate. You can have oral complaints, which may be resolved within a day uh, to the satisfaction of complainant, and they may be informal, and there are similar structures in Scotland. Uh, written and oral complaints not resolved within a day are, are formal by definition and must be handled in accordance with the regulations. Ultimately, if you're not sure of, of whether what you've heard from the patient is a complaint or not, or whether it's just feedback, ask them. Ask them, how do you want this to be handled? So it's important, I think, for primary care that all staff who interact with patients are able to recognise a complaint. They're, they're able and empowered to recognise what they can resolve promptly there and then. They should recognise what needs to be investigated fully and know how to manage oral complaints, as in take a note of it and ask the patient to confirm that the note they've taken is accurate. And this conforms with the approach that's set out by the Parliamentary and Health Services Ombudsman. Again, that's an English organisation. There's a similar organisation in Scotland and Wales and in Northern Ireland. And the approaches that they recommend are very similar. So I'm going to mention the English one. The approach is more generalisable. But they talk about the practice and the doctors and staff listening carefully, confirming what the complainant's concerns are and the issues to be investigated. Ask the complainant what they want to achieve and can this be resolved straight away. If appropriate, manage expectations when, they, when they're expecting something completely unreasonable and explain what is possible within the boundaries of what you're doing. Explain how long the process is going to take. Uh, be open and realistic about that. Agree how to keep the complainant updated and involved and how often. Explain what will happen next. So here's an idea. Or here's an example, should I say, of a, of a complaint that um, somebody might see. I've recently been discharged from hospital, having had an operation to remove bowel cancer and left the stoma. I want to know why I wasn't referred urgently when I had constipation back in March and saw a doctor. If I had been, I, I might not be in my 40s with a stoma. The district nurse are trying to help me. I'm still struggling with it. They give me a list of things that needed to be added to my repeat prescription. I phoned the practice, but the receptionist kept telling me they don't take requests for medication over the phone without an assessment. It was only when I made an emergency appointment at the surgery that I was able to get this resolved. Again, I apologize. This is a general practice uh, orientated complaint. It, there are take homes, I think, from this for people in, in secondary care as well. So the first thing that needs to happen when you get a complaint is that the complaint has to be acknowledged. And while the timescales vary, in England it has to be within three working days. You must give the complainant an opportunity to discuss how the complaint will be investigated and when a response uh, will be issued. But just an acknowledgement, well, it could be so much more than just that. Let's look at two different versions of an acknowledgement. We're sorry that you felt the need to complain, and we'll respond to your concerns within 10 days. Let's try something different. 
I'm sorry to hear about your diagnosis of bowel cancer and your concern that your treatment was delayed. I understand your main concern was that you should have been referred to hospital sooner, and I'll investigate that concern with our doctors. I know you'll need to seek care from the practice while you do this, and I can reassure you your care will not be affected. I've set out how I, I plan to investigate your complaint below. Please get in touch on the phone number uh, if you feel there are other people I should speak to as well. I hope you'll be able to respond to your complaint. Sorry, I hope we'll be able to respond to your complaint by such and such a date, but I'll keep you updated of progress every two weeks and let you know what I think we'll be able to do and where we'll be able to respond by. So I think that it's fair to say that by comparison to the first um, uh, response, where you've sort of diminished the um, uh, the, the complainant by saying felt the need to complain ra rather than recognizing what the issues are uh, and you've also made it quite difficult for yourself by giving yourself a tight deadline in the second response you've been a bit more um, empathetic in the approach that's taken you've set out what you're going to do you've made it clear that they can get in contact with you about that and they've, you've undertaken to keep in contact with them um, as the complaint process goes further. So the acknowledgement is an opportunity, I think, to uh, identify um, what points will be investigated in oral complaints to deal with issues of consent. So, for instance, when a, a, a parent complains about a child who may well have capacity or a child complains about their elderly parent's care, you may have to go and uh, consider the issue of consent and even seek consent to 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 respond. It's an opportunity to manage expectations as well. You can be clear about what you're going to be investigating, when a response will be issued, uh, what is reasonable uh, for the complaint handling to achieve, and this really uh, adheres to the response. Uh, sorry, good complaint handling that the Parliamentary and Health Service Ombudsman talk about. The approach from the PHSO, again an English body, is very set, similar to that set out for by Ombudsman across all four nations of the UK. So the PHO set out three steps to good complaint handling and step one uh, talks about listening carefully, confirming the complainant's concerns and the issues to be investigated. It, asks, it suggests that one asks the complainant what they want to achieve. It tells you that you should be appropriate, uh, that if appropriate, you should be managing expectations and explain what is possible. Explain how long the process is going to take and be open and realistic. Agree about updates and explain what will happen next. So, if you handle it this way, when if the PHSO or Ombudsman elsewhere come to look at how you've handled a complaint, they're going to see that you as the practice have handled it well. So let's look at that letter again. How would we investigate that? Well, there'd be a few different steps that we would have to take because there's issues here with the doctor's assessment. There's issues here regarding uh, the interaction with the receptionist as well. So in terms of your investigative step, you're also going to have to speak to the receptionist. You're going to have to speak to the doctor concerned and the practice as a whole are going to have to review the clinical management, ideally with reflections from the doctor an input from that complaint meeting and review. And this is a really important part about complaints. It's not for individual doctors to um, manage all aspects of the complaint. The com practice are responsible for managing it. And all of the practice should review all of the issues raised in the complaint and talk about them and see if there's anything that can be learned more generally from the complaint. In terms of um, the next step of good complaint handling, the, um, the uh, ombudsman is very clear that you should be 
sharing your investigation plan before you start it. We've kind of hinted at that in the acknowledgement letter. Tell the complainant how you're going to investigate it and offer and offer them the opportunity to make any other suggestions that need to that might add to the investigation. You need to be clear about what evidence you will be considering, so who you're going to be speaking to, um, uh, what advice or independent opinions you'll be getting. So in a practice, you might make sure that it's been discussed with others who have not been involved in the management of that patient. If you're a consultant in a hospital, you might want to speak to other members of the MDT or other members of the department uh, in which you work to get their input on the, on the complaint and see if there are any learning points uh, that they can bring to the table. You need to indicate to your complaint how you're going to evaluate the complaint. What are you going to compare what happened in their case uh, to what should have happened? What are you going to use as your comparator or your evidence? So things like national guidance, be it NICE or sign guidance, would be useful starting points. And who will be involved in, in the decision making? Who is the responsible person for deciding whether or not the complaint is upheld? You also need to show that you've looked at the complaint objectively, and that's really important if other people become involved in this. Try and establish what should have happened, compare that with what did happen, and try and give equal weight to what the complainant says to what your staff say. And that can be difficult. I'll come on to that in the next one, next slide. Try to show as well that you've applied objective criteria to determine um, clinical issues as far as possible. Refer to guidelines, referral criteria, or authoritative reference sources. One of the difficulties is, though, often the um, sources of information that you have don't agree. So you have a family or a patient on one side saying one thing and staff saying something different. Hopefully, the contemporaneous clinical record will support staff in what they say happened again. And of course, this is the huge benefit that you have as clinicians and as, uh, in, the, in the practice or in the hospitals, that you write things down at the time that it happens. But there's a, an alternative view, which is that for the patient, um, these interactions may be only one interaction with you. And, and for them, it may be seared onto their brain what happened. So it's really important that you keep contemporaneous records of an interaction as far as that is possible. Although people may dispute because they remember it so intensely, what, what you have recorded, the fact that you have recorded it uh, is beneficial. Sometimes, however, there's just no specific record of, of the interaction. In that instance, it's better to acknowledge the doubt, to say that, well, I haven't recorded X, I would normally do Y, and if I didn't in your case, I'm really sorry. Ultimately, you can't resolve strongly held opinions of what happened without information in the record or perhaps recorded in a different way, perhaps in call recording or in CCTV. All you can do is come down to a reasonable judgment that doesn't or isn't seen to dismiss out of hand patient concerns, but equally isn't throwing staff under the, bu under the bus, so to speak, without considering the information that's in the record uh, about the interaction. So let's have a look at uh, a comparison here. Um, we've reviewed your complaints of practice and all the doctors agreed that they would have done the same as Dr. X when you attended uh, in March. Compare that to, well, we've reviewed your care as a significant event to analyze whether you could have been referred under a two-week rule earlier than July 2019. To do that, we've consulted the NICE guidance on suspected bowel cancer, and this states that someone in their 40s can be referred under a two-week wait pathway if they have unexplained abdominal pain and weight loss or blood in their stool on testing. And when you saw Dr. X, uh, she established that your symptoms were off, whatever. And of course, the second bullet point here is probably the better of the two, isn't it? Because it refers to 
established national guidance. It's clear about what the symptoms that were discussed were um, and how they then refer back to that uh, NICE guidance. When it comes to responding um, after you've had your investigation, after you've had your discussion, you have to start with an appropriate introduction. Um, in other words, an expression of empathy and an explanation of what has been investigated and how that was done. So again, we're kind of repeating ourselves in the, in the approach here, but what you're really doing is showing, is showing a uniformity of approach across the whole of the process. In the middle of it, you'll explain what happened. You'll respond to each point in the complaint and give your analysis of that. So when I'm looking at a complaint with a member, I make sure that I go through it and I highlight all of the bits that need to be responded to because sometimes it's easy to focus on certain aspects and not others and thereby not make not answer all of the points which just engenders further correspondence it's important to cover any learning points or practice changes in practice that have resulted from their complaint a lot of patients are really only looking for evidence that the practice uh, has changed or the doctor involved in their uh, complaint to a hospital has changed as a result of that interaction. At the end, it's important that you make it clear to the patient what they can do if they remain dissatisfied with um, uh, your response. And I always suggest that doctors say, look, I'm happy to meet with you to discuss it if you're not happy, uh, just so that they don't go off to other modes of resolution, for instance, the Ombudsman or worse, the GMC with the complaint, without having come to speak to you or the practice more generally about um, the complaint and your response. You're also obligated wherever you are in the UK to give details of the relevant Ombudsman, be that the English one, the Scottish one, the Welsh or the one in Northern Ireland. Uh, an extra piece of learning, we do have some guidance on um, local resolution meetings on the MDU website and there's going to be more e-learning on complaints coming out probably in the next four weeks or so which will be accessible to members on the website as well. So do remember that Although that we're doing this talk tonight and there's we've got PDFs and such like on the website, there is e-learning on there as well, which is related and relevant to this. So this leads us up to step three of good complaint handling from the PHSO, which is about making and sharing your decision. And I'm going to quote directly from them here because I think it's quite good. When we look at a complaint, we consider the response that your organization has already given. So before you send your final response to the complainant, make sure it's as good a response, it's a good response like you would want to receive yourself. And I think that's always a good, it's a sort of a version of the of how your the granny test, how you would like your granny to be treated in the hospital. It's a similar sort of thing, isn't it? You want the response that you get or that you give to be as like the response you would like to receive yourself. So it should be clear and compassionate, clearly setting out the issues the complaint raised, what they wanted to achieve, using language that's empathetic and the complainant can understand, really important if you're in a particularly technical speciality or you're dealing with technical aspects of general practice that require some explanation. Provide evidence, set out how you've investigated the complaint, what evidence you've considered and, and you know, who you've, who you've uh, interviewed, for example. Um, and if the complaint is about the standard of NHS care and treatment given, include a clinical opinion from somebody else who's not directly related to the case, if possible. So a GP in the practice who's not been directly involved. Be clear about whether something went wrong or not. Set out what happened with reference to the evidence, what should have happened if it's something different, quoting relevant regulations, standards or policies, and if those, uh, if the pra if those policies um, if those regulations and standards were met in this case. If there's a difference between what happened and what should have happened, be clear about that and explain what this is and what impact it's had. 
be clear about what action the practice will take or you as an individual will, clinician will take as a result of this complaint. What have you, what have you learned? Um, there is uh, really good guidance on this on the Ombudsman's website, and they in fact refer to the Scottish uh, Public Services Ombudsman's, um, sorry, the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman's website on for guidance on how to make an apology. So there's lots of information out there on how to do it. In England, one of the unusual things is this idea of financial redress where appropriate, and that's something that the, the Ombudsman is keen for people to consider. Um, if that's something that comes up in, in discussion, then I would recommend that you discuss it with us and we, we sort of have a, a, a joint view on the, on the appropriateness of that. Um, we don't think it's something that doctors should be engaging in, um, off their own bat, it may impact on, on claims, but it is something that we recognise the Ombudsman likes, so it's something that we can certainly talk about with you. In terms of complainants and meeting with them, if somebody remains unhappy, it's always worthwhile trying to get them into a meeting to discuss what still remains unresolved, and the meeting should be at a mutually convenient time. It should set out enough time to, for them to be able to explain all of the issues, and it should be in an appropriate venue with the appropriate people. So it's going to be the patient and their supporter. It's going to be the relevant complaint uh, lead from the practice or the consultant from the hospital. There may be a note taker there as well from the practice or from the PALS team if you're in the hospital. And um, it's helpful to try and establish that at the start. What information will be discussed, how long it's going to take, where it's going to happen, and who will be chairing that meeting. After the meeting, you're going to follow up, summarise the discussion that was had in a letter, and reiterate with the complainant, again, what they can do if they remain unsatisfied with the process. The Ombudsman is the next step in general for when things go wrong and patients aren't happy with care, be that in um, uh, primary care or secondary care. Uh, the Ombudsman doesn't work um, uh, on um, privately funded care, um, so in that circumstance, while there are other organisations that are similar, there's nobody with that general overview that the PHSO and similar have in the other nations. So in private practice, when somebody's unhappy, there's a greater risk in our experience that patients are going to go to the GMC uh, um, when they're not happy with a complaint. But happily, uh, in NHS care, there's the Ombudsman as that middle ground between um, the practice, the doctor, and the GMC. The PHSO, uh, the other Ombudsman, will look at not just the clinical care, but how you have handled the complaint. So all these things I've been talking about, this, the three steps to good complaint handling that we've outlined, these are things that you will be measured against, be it a trust, a local health board, or a practice, uh, in terms of how you have handled the complaint. There will usually be an opportunity to comment as a practice or as a doctor on the intention to investigate a complaint to the Ombudsman and there will be an opportunity to comment on a draft report before it is finalised. Um, outcome recommendations can include asking a practice team to apologise, there may be remedial actions in place, and in England particularly, there is this uh, risk of financial remedies being applied against the practice. If you're involved in an Ombudsman case, and that's not just the PHSO, but also the Public Service Ombudsman for Wales, the NIPSO in Northern Ireland, or the Scottish Ombudsman. Um, seek advice. Uh, in England, tell NHS resolution about it. In Wales, tell GMPI. And make sure you have done, this is actually quite an important point, make sure you've done what you said you would do in the response. It's surprising the number of times we see complaints that go to the Ombudsman with a plan for 
what the practice or what the team will do as a result of it. And when you ask whether or not that's been done, they say, oh no, we, we didn't do that, we, we forgot to do it. So, in summary, after 40 minutes of talking, I'm really sorry, um, we recognise that complaints are frequent, stressful, but important. It's important that you communicate clearly with the complainant, that you investigate objectively and have a properly structured empathetic response, that you share learning and that you plan for meetings, being clear about what the next steps are if they are unhappy with um, your response. There are good resources out there for complaints handlers, um, and I say that when I say complaints handlers, I mean you as GPs, you as consultants in private practice, uh, you as doctors in neither of those positions, but having to write responses. These um, resources are really useful um, and worth having a look at. And there's plenty of information on the website and it's soon to be augmented and I would recommend that you go and have a look. And please, please remember that we do this every day. For you, a complaint might be a once a year, once five years, once in a career event. Uh, for us, we see these all the time and we see them from very simple ones to extreme ones that, that spiral out of control for doctors. So, we struggle to tell how a complaint will go, um, which means that I would suspect for somebody or for people who get them less frequently, you're less likely than we are to know how a complaint will, what the outcome of a complaint will be. So get some help. You're members of the MDU, we're here to help you and I would encourage you to uh, ask us for assistance uh, with your complaints, even if you are surrounded by a trust, even if you are um, in a practice which seems to be well organised and will we'll do it well, you think, take our advice, that's what we're here for and we want to help you. Okay, I think that's that for the moment. Shall we um, end the slideshow and see if we've got any questions? Hi Gerard, or shall I kick awesome. off? There's lots of questions that have been coming oh. in. Um, okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. So um, a few a few people have asked. Uh, so I'll, I'll pick up on this topic to start with about vexatious complainants or uh, people who complain yeah. all the time. How do you manage with what you think might be a vexatious complaint and or a frivolous complaint or or where you feel yeah. the motives are not not true maybe and and leading on from that, what can you do about that patient? Can you take them off the practice list, for example, in general practice? What steps can you take mm -hmm. to try and limit a recurrence of that sort of behaviour? I know either of you want to kick off on that. It's Any a, comments? It's a, really, it's a really, a really common one, isn't it? We see that a lot, and um, yeah. uh, often uh, we're we're come to us discuss that part of it, that thing, that talking the patient. Um, I always talk, make sure that when the, the complaint is reviewed by an external body, um, they're going to they're going to look like this. They've all done it all properly. They've gone through the things as per the regulations. They're not going to be criticised for their complaint handling. So yes, there are vexation complainants. Yes, there are ways of managing them. And yes, ultimately, um, it is an option to remove somebody from the list for their behaviour. And that unreasonable behaviour may include unreasonable complaint behaviour. But it's about building up the evidence of that over time, um, uh, answering, re answering questions that are part of the complaint, being seen to answer those questions reasonably. And wh when um, the patients are continuing to complain over the same things, pointing to previous complaint responses saying we've answered this before um, you can see that in complaint response dated x and when uh, they keep on doing it saying look you're being unreasonable we're warning you about your behavior at this point and if you keep on doing it we will remove you and by that stage i would hope the practice would have built up a lot of information to support um, uh, removal if it, if it gets that albeit it should be rare um, that that happens, but unfortunately, there's 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 
or was that as a possible outcome? Yeah. Ed? Thank you. Yeah. Jared, just to, to add on that, I can see a couple of questions have come through where, um, you know, we talked about removals being rare and, and I can see there's a lot of anger about complaints uh, being misused yeah. and, and also that, that, that there is an imbalance of, of power with a statutory framework being present for complaints, but, you know, who do we complain to? And of course, part of that is is inevitable. You know, we, we are the service providers. There's a complaints framework in the NHS, and and we have yeah. to work with that. And we'd be foolish to tell you that that would would change. There are a couple of questions that have come in though that I want to be very clear about. One is is what do you do with a person who has been violent or very oh. aggressive to staff? Now that is something you report to the police. You get a crime number, and it's yeah. one of the circumstances where you can immediately remove the patient from the practice list without a warning and yeah. similarly about patients aggressively uh, seeking medication or benzodiazepines etc well you don't have to deal with the aggression if they complain you deal with the complaint uh, and if they've got a substance misuse issue you would separate that out and offer them help with it you know none of what we're saying today is really about you having to tolerate bad behavior and i can't be clear about that and we certainly are very happy to advise on 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 managing bad behavior as well if that that occurs ed have you got any questions you want to ask yeah there are some um some again general points about complaint handling there's a quick one yeah. where it said should we offer to reply in writing to an oral complaint J just to re-emphasize jared's point from the presentation that any oral complaint not resolved in a day becomes a formal complaint and you have to respond to it in writing as as any other complaint um the other thing that i just wanted to touch on is is you know more questions about when complaints should be notified to to an indemnifier um just to, to sort of give a bit of detail on that we certainly don't demand that you uh, share complaints with us we're very happy to help with them it, you you must also be mindful of the notification requirements for nhs resolution say for example if you get any correspondence from the ombudsman you do need to let nhs resolution know about that so again be mindful of those obligations as well um in, in terms of complaints yeah and they've got a, they've got a huge list of oh well, not a huge list that's an exaggeration but they've got a, a list of things about which they need to to be made aware so for those who aren't uh, aware of nhs resolution it's 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 the clinical negligence scheme for general practice it provides um uh, general practice indemnity in england there's a similar thing in wales gmpi um uh, we don't have one in scotland uh, and there's not one in northern ireland yet yeah, and, th and there's another couple of interesting things on that point of an oral complaint resolved in a day. Um, and, and I've got a question here saying, do we mean on the day or do you mean the patient has 48 hours, sorry, 24 hours to think about whether they're happy? The wording of the regulation is, is that an oral complaint resolved to the patient's satisfaction within 24 hours. So so essentially one working day, if, if it seems that, that the matter has been resolved, that doesn't fall under the regulations or written response uh, if it's ongoing if you're getting ongoing correspondence then then that would certainly be the case um, and also a really interesting question here about whether the CQC expect a certain level of complaints according to patient list size and demographics um, mm. uh, and I think that touches on a really important point in that when practices are looked at, it, it's really about how you involve your patients, how responsive you are, how you deal with complaints. Uh, and it's not having no complaints that's taken to be the kind of gold standard. And, and that's a really important thing to remember as well. Yeah, on that, on that point, having no complaints, it's, it's, I'm sorry, it's a tangential thing. I, I always get slightly anxious when somebody tells me they've had they've, they've been clinical medicine for 30 years and never had any complaints because whilst that may be true for a tiny proportion of, of doctors um you know complaints are really common and there's a risk that you may not be recognizing um what complaints are i think in circumstances and maybe it's just my experience uh, you know, maybe i did have complaints but uh, i think they are more common uh, than 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 that um, I think they're probably increasing in, in, in frequency as well. That's, uh, that might just be my perception, but I, I, that, that's a feeling I get. I don't know whether that's your perception as well, Ed and Gerard, or you know, what noticed a trend in particular, or, or no? no. 
maybe not. It's difficult to tell, isn't it? Yes. Just another question here that I think is really um, is, is a good one. Um, someone's asked here, how many years after any encounter is it possible to have a complaint about it? So, um, yeah, is there is there a is there a time limit um, beyond an account where somebody can't can't bring a complaint? So, so I'll start that one. Um, there is there is a time limit, and it varies bet between the nations, but it's roughly about a year in general. But the point of it is that the um, it's not a hard and fast line in the sand. That but that after that time you cannot respond because it may be that the complaint actually raises important issues um, uh, about uh, care uh, that need to be addressed, even if it is beyond a year. It may be that the person only became aware of it, um, it that the issue was actually a, 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 an issue to be complained about um, at the, after a year had passed because they saw a different person. So I think that um, whilst there are these timescales in the legislation, um, and similarly there are timescales in the GMC complaints um, legislation, legislation. Um, I think they should be interpreted carefully and um, I would be reluctant to throw out a, an important um, complaint merely on the basis of, of time if there was something you know something in there to, to be considered. Um, I, I can't think I've told anybody to ignore a complaint just because it's over 12 months ever. Yeah. Um, actually, um, Ed, you've been you've been doing this longer than I have. Have you told people to ignore something because it's over twelve months old? I think it's um, again, if if you go back to a kind of complaints arrangement, and again in the jurisdictions, they all say the similar sort of thing that that's a general timescale, but the complaint should be accepted if it remains possible for you to investigate it. So I, I sometimes have said. Um, you'll just have to explain to the complainant that they, you can't accept it and it's out of time, but that's on the basis that actually the issues are so old, there are no records, there's nobody contactable who can shed any light on it, and it's actually impossible for you to investigate it. Yeah. Otherwise, I, I might suggest that we manage expectations at the start uh, in explaining how limited the investigation may be, but that you you will try and 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 sort of do that. And I know we're close of time, but there's a very practical question that I wanted to raise here as well, saying that if a complaint's made by somebody on behalf of the patient, should we seek the patient's uh, permission uh, before responding? Yes. Yeah, I know we're, we're limited on time, but that's a short answer for a short yeah. question there. But yeah, we are running out of time. Has, has anyone got any more to add on that, or uh, or assuming they have capacity? Yes, I could I could expand a little bit more, mm. but um, I think that's it in a nutshell. I know we are running out of time, but I've just seen a really good question, and I really would just like to talk about that briefly. It's actually from somebody who I think is a, a trainee in general practice, but equally it could be uh, a question from somebody who's in a large any large any organisation who's been asked to comment on a complaint. Uh, and the, the, the question asker has said, can they reply on whoever's handling the complaint to, to deal with it? So can they just pass their account over and just assume that that's it and all will be well? Of course, you know, you could do that, but I, I would, my advice generally, and I don't know what you both say, Ed and Gerard, is that you'd be probably very well advised to just ask to see a draft of the final response before it actually gets sent so that you can be sure that it, it accurately represents your position. Uh, and that's, that's the advice I, I frequently give, whether somebody's in general practice or, or in a trust. And I, I don't know if you've got comments to add to that. I, I think that's absolutely right, because I think there's quite a lengthy question about um, managing of complaints in secondary care and the number of people who, who see them and, and how it can get lost in the ether. And I think that's absolutely right. And I think your best defence is, yes, asking to, to keep informed. But if you write a really clear complaint and response, it's not full of jargon. It's something that literally can be cut and pasted into a response. Um, it's likely to be because everybody's busy and then you can make sure you can get your thoughts directly in, in that response. So absolutely, I agree. I have one point you mentioned as a, as a trainee. Trainees move around. I know I did a lot. Um, it's really important that you, do, if you do move around, that you let people know where you're going if you're not aware of a complaint and ask them to make sure you're kept in the loop as things develop so you don't see a response that goes out, say, from an old trust or health board that's developed significantly from your initial commentary on that, you know, a year before or whenever that was. Gosh, there'd be a lot of, uh, we haven't got even close to answering all those questions that have come in. I'm really sorry we didn't. Uh, 
um, managed to answer more in the time we had. Thank you very much, uh, Sam and, and Ed, for, for doing that um, with me this evening. And thank you uh, to everybody who's attended and asked so many, uh, so many questions. Um, as I said, we will be trying to repeat this um, and we'll, we'll go through the questions as well, Ed and I and Sam, and see if there's anything, that, anything else that we can add to this um, afterwards. But uh, thank you very much for attending. I think that will be all for this evening, if that's okay. Have a nice night. Good night. Night.